Moses and the people of Israel are now on their journey to the promised land. They've left Mount Sinai behind, and they're on the trek now to get to the land that God promised that he would give to them, a land flowing with milk and honey. We saw in chapter 11 there at the beginning of it, right from the get-go, however, they were complaining about the conditions. It's kind of interesting. God has made very clear to you, I am now taking you to a glorious place. You are on your way to a glorious place, and they're complaining about the conditions. I don't know about you, but that sounds kind of familiar to me, you know? But one of the first things that happened was fire broke out kind of around the outskirts of the camp. And it freaked the people out. They recognized, this is a strange fire. This word this come from? This is from God. They beseech Moses, Moses, pray, pray for us. Moses prayed, and the Lord quenched the fire. That was in those first three verses of the 11th chapter. And you can sort of see that, based on what happened there, as th this was a wake-up call from God to these people. And basically, it was, it was sort of like, quit complaining. And, you know, his point is, I am with you. What are you complaining about? I am with you, and I'm leading you. So, so quit complaining. But, boy, aren't we slow to learn. Isn't it built into the old psyche to be complainers, you know? So we pick it up at verse 4. <clears throat> That's what happened in the first three. Now, the mixed multitude who were among them yielded to intense craving. Now, the mixed multitude, what he's saying there is there were people that were on this trek with Israel, with the Hebrew people that weren't Hebrew. They weren't for a blooded Hebrew. There, 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 were, there were some that married in, you know, and they were maybe Egyptian or something else. Maybe they married a Hebrew, you know, and so they're along. But there were also Egyptians and either people from, from various other local nations and, and like that that had come along with them. And Scripture refers to them as the mixed multitude, you know. They're not, they're not the full-blooded Hebrew people. Uh, you know, maybe they were looking for greener pastures. and thought, We're going we're gonna to go with these folks. I would imagine, after the ten plagues that happened in Egypt, that there was, a, there was an element of people that said, hey, man, I'm out of here. I'm going with them, you know. And so there was this, this mixed multitude that weren't the pure Hebrew stock. And you know what they become a picture of to us? They become a picture of the, the unbelievers, the non-believers that are mixed in the church, you know? Every church will have, by nature in it, a mixed multitude that haven't really given their hearts and lives to Christ. But they like maybe the atmosphere of the church. You know, they, uh, you know they, they, they've got maybe friends there. It, it, you know, it's a neat kind of a social thing, and they, and they sort of like the way it is or something, and so they're, they're kind of going along for the ride. And, and, and they're the mixed multitude, but they're not truly born-again believers. Jesus makes clear that the church is going to be like that in his parable of the wheat and the tares, all mixed together, you know, the wheat. God's chosen the tares, you know, the weeds that are kind of mixed in. The parable of the ten virgins. Five have oil in their laps, five don't. You've got five that are truly born of the Spirit of God, and you've got five others who, uh, you know, are dressed the same way and everything, but, but there's no spirit. And so, uh, and so you've got that, that condition in the church. And it's saying, it's saying now as they're going along, it's this group that, as it says here, yielded to intense craving. That's one word in the Hebrew. And they're trying to explain it. But the idea is, is that they, they were lusting in, in, intently. They'd gotten into just intense lusting, you know? Really, what it, they were focusing on, and there was welling up within them you might say that natural craving of the old man 
for things of the world. You know? The, the, the attractiveness of, of things of the world. And, it, and you, you begin, they begin focusing on that and thinking about that. And there's sort of a welling up inside of that, that natural craving that can go on, which is totally of the old man, the old nature. That's, that's the nature of, of lusting. And when you kind of let that go, I mean, it can build up into a frenzy. Pretty soon you're saying, I got to have, I got to have, I got to have, you know? And it just sort of takes over, and that's, that's what's going on here. That's, that, that, that's what's happening in the camp. Well, look what happens going on. So the children of Israel, now these are the, this is the Hebrew stock, also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we ate freely in Egypt, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our whole being is dried up, and there is nothing uh, at all except that this manna before our eyes. You know, you know they've been, uh, they're sort of remembering, you know, some of the, some of the niceties that they, they had in Egypt. They've been over a year out in the wilderness now, and they're craving some of the things of Egypt. What's interesting about that is Egypt symbolizes for us, the world, the things of the world, the attractiveness of the world. And, you know, they're, they're, they're beginning to, you know, they just desire some of those things of Egypt. Uh, it, thinking of the, the, what the world has to offer the flesh. And it's interesting. You can get in that kind of a mode and you forget. It's easy to forget uh, the, the bondage and, and the, the suffering uh, the, the, the misery that was there is you just, you know, remember the goodies. And so, and so th that's what's going on here. What's interesting, this complaining began with the mixed multitude. But now it's infected the, 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 the people themselves, the quote unquote, the believers themselves. That reminds me of what we're told in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15 where we're told, looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. You know, it's interesting. You get in a, a, a complaining mode, how easy it is to pick that up. You know, somebody starts complaining about somebody, and pretty soon you're going, yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, you know, and as I think about it, I agree. You know, and, and complaining can just, can just snowball that way. And that's what's going on. Now, God has faithfully supplied, faithfully supplied this bread from heaven, this manna, for them to go out and gather freely. And it's been God's provision for them. But now they're complaining against God's provision. That's what complaint does. You know, God promised to take care of us. God promised to provide for us. And he is doing that. And when we get in a complaining mode, we're complaining about his provision. So that's, what, that's what's going on here. Look what he says going on in verse 7. Now the manna was like coriander seed. Let's talk about that manna for a minute, he says, that they're complaining about. The manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of delium. The people went about and gathered it, ground it on millstones or beat it with the mortar, cooked it in pans, made cakes of it, and its taste was like the taste of pastry prepared with oil. And when the dew fell on the camp in the night, the manna fell on it. Wow, you know what he's saying? Manna was great. Manna was really good stuff. It was the bread of heaven. It was God's food for them, and it was good. It's interesting and intriguing to me that Jesus uses the manna to describe himself. He says in John, he says, you know, your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, and, and, and that was from God. That was the bread from God, and they died. Well, guess what? I am the bread of life. You eat this bread, you'll live forever. The bread I give is my body, it's myself.
to you. Think about that for a minute. And then look at the manna. He related himself. He said, I'm the eternal bread from heaven. And, and, you know, you just sort of consider the manna. Sort of interesting. The manna came, as it were, from heaven. And it was from the Father for the people. Jesus came from heaven from the Father for the people. It was a free gift to them, as Jesus is. That color of the manna was white. White is symbolic of the righteousness of God. And then it, it, it came right to where the people were. Wherever the people were, that's where it came. It came out in the wilderness for them. You know what's interesting? In, ex in Exodus 16 and Numbers 33, it's called, grab this, the wilderness of sin. Isn't that interesting? That's the name of it. And God sent the manna out there for them. Each one had to receive it. You couldn't sit in your tent. You had to receive it personally. It was very adequate. They ground it. They beat it. They cooked it. Jesus bore the cross for us. But it was so sweet to the taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Manna makes a beautiful picture of, of Jesus for us. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It was great food. The manna was really good. But isn't it interesting that, uh, if you notice what the world has to offer us, always comes in the prettiest package possible. You know, it wants it, one of, the, you know, the enemy wants to make it look so good. The world wants to make it look, look so good. It'll come in the prettiest package it can possibly come. And as they were remembering Egypt, they were remembering the goodies, you know? And, and they were forgetting the, the oppressive bondage. They were forgetting the slavery. They were forgetting the suffer, suffering. They were forgetting the misery that they experienced there. And all they could think about was the goodies. And so they're complaining. And the more they were complaining, the more they complained. And, and then the more they complained, the more people complained. And pretty soon, the whole camp is just crying and complaining. And they're looking at the manna and going, yuck. I don't want manna. So verse 10. Then Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. Everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was greatly aroused. Moses also was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, he's going to go to the Lord with this. Why have you afflicted your servant? <laughs> I've got to admit, I think I've said that prayer myself. <laughs> Why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid this burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep all over me saying, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. You think he's turning in his resignation? I mean, <laughs> you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. <laughs> You're not treating me very nice at all, God. If I have found favor in your sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. Oh, I'm sick and tired of this. There's Moses, all that complaining. All that discontentment has just discouraged God's servant. And he is one discouraged man right now. It's to the point where, Lord, just take me out. Get me out of here. 
It, it, is this what you have for me? It, this is what you've given me? Thanks a lot, God. That's what you see I'm feeling right here. You know, complaints. Complaints can seem reasonable. There is a, a sense of, yeah, reasonableness about complaints. But you know something? Complaining is diametrically different than requesting. You see, our Lord tells us, make your request before me, but do it with thanksgiving. The heart of thanksgiving. Don't be anxious about anything. Come to me with your request. But brethren, complaining comes from a heart of discontentment. Doesn't the Lord say, godliness with contentment is great gain. And complaining comes from a heart of discontentment. And that is an evil and an unbelieving heart. And the infection of that, of that discontentment and that complaining defiles other people. It's defiling to them, and it discourages others. The people have, have been defiled by this, and the Lord's servant has been discouraged by it. Ah, oh, oh, complaining. You know, that just the opposite of giving thanks and praising and, and trusting encourages, encourages those around it, builds up the body, encourages the servants. Complaining and discontentment does the opposite. And boy, do, boy, do you see it here. So God, right now, has got two things to deal with. He's got his complaining people. They're all complaining. They're just a chorus of complaints. And he's got a discouraged servant. So he's going to deal with this discouraged servant first. Verse 16. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand before me, stand there before with you. Then I will come down and I'll talk with you there. I will take of the spirit that is upon you and I will put the same upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you that you may not bear it yourself alone. You know what I love about this? God is faithful to his servants. He's always faithful to his servants. He will help them in time of need. You know, you can bank on that. As a servant of the Lord, you can bank on his help in time of need. There can be times when it looks like everything's going to pieces, falling apart and caving in, and the Lord will help in a time of need. Now, I've been doing this for 40 plus years now. And it's gotten to the point now where when I'm feeling that way, I just know God's going to do something. And I, I just expect it, you know? It's like that little old black lady would say, you know, uh, you know, when everything caves in, when, you know, and, and it feels like it's, it's going apart, it reminds me that there was a Friday that was a Black Friday. Blackest day in world history. But three days later, there was the most glorious day in human history, the resurrection. And so she said, you know what? When some things seem like they're going apart, I give it three days, and sure enough, there's a resurrection. You know? We, we serve a, a faithful God. It's interesting that back in Exodus chapter 18, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, had suggested that he pick out men to bear the burden with him. And apparently, at that point, it, it, it sort of came to naught. Not, 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 nothing much happened. And so Moses is feeling very alone here. And so now the Lord himself intervenes here. 
And, and I love it because it, it's sort of like the Lord stepping in. Now it's the Lord's timing and it's going to be the Lord's provision and the anointing of the Lord is going to come upon them and that's going to make all the difference. That's going to take it from, gee, that was a good idea. I wonder why it didn't work. To, Look what the Lord is doing. Chuck Smith used to tell us all the time as pastors, your job isn't try to make something happen at your church. Your job is to see what the Lord is doing and go with him. You know? And, and you see what, what, what God is doing, or God says he's going to do what God's going to do, and and Lord's, you know, saying, here we go. What I like about this, and what an example of this truth it is, is that any time you're involved in the Lord's work in any way, and you're going to be called out to do the work of the Lord in any way, it's going to require the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You can't do it yourself. You, none of us have that capability. It's got to be with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Any work. You know why? Because whatever that job is, it's spiritual in nature because it's dealing with the things of God, the people of God, and the work of God. That's passing out bulletins on Sunday morning to wiping diapers in the nursery, to ministering to the folks, to sharing. You know, it, it, it's all... It, it, it's all a spiritually oriented work that takes the ministry and the anointing and the working of the Holy Spirit. So that tells me right there, and this is so important, anytime we're going to do any kind of work, volunteer work, whatever it is, for the Lord, number one, we've got to go to the Lord and say, sort of, Lord, Lord, is this what you would have me do? You know there's such a thing as a sanctified no if somebody asks you to do something. Oh, we need help over here. Will you help us? Boy, you can feel the pressure. But if you know in your heart, this is what the Lord has for me. There's such a thing as a sanctified of the Lord. No. And so you go to the Lord. That's why, you know, here at Calvary, when, when we approach somebody about, about doing anything in the way of ministry in our church, we want them to pray about it and get their, get their direction and get the calling from the Lord and not from us. Want it to be from the Lord. And I've uh, many times told people, you pray about it. And if you don't feel this is, you, you're not getting this from the Lord. as a call from the Lord. Then you come and just say, no, thank you. And you don't even have to give me a reason. I don't need an excuse. It's just, you know, a sanctified no is fine. I want who God wants to do this job. I don't want, you know, and grab somebody out of the blue and stick them in there. No, I want it to be, I want it to be an, an appointment from the Lord. So it's, Lord, are you, is this from you? Is this what you would have me to do? And listen to your heart. And then, if you sense that, yeah, it may be a, well, of course, why not? Get going. Then, Brethren, 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 go into that, whatever it is, prayerfully, prayerfully. Pray for his guiding hand to be upon you. Pray for his empowering in that work. That whatever you're doing will, will have the unseen hand of the living God working in you and working through you and working in those circumstances for his glory. And he is fully capable of doing that in the most menial kinds of tasks. That's why the church in Acts, when they wanted to find some men that would wait on the tables for the widows, that's a pretty low job. They say, we want men of wisdom and righteousness who are filled with the Holy Spirit to do that work because it's a, it's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's always a work of the Holy Spirit. I would have, I would, I would prefer we did, we did very little, but what was being done was a work of the Holy Spirit than doing a whole lot that was just spinning our wheels and making us Look like, gee, look at us. We're so active. We're so busy. We're doing so much. Aren't we great? You can have it. The world can have it. That church can have it. I want us to be led and built by him. So the Lord says, you pick out 70 guys 
And this is going to be from me. I'm going to do it. Now, regarding the people's complaining, that's his word to his servant. Now, regarding the people's complaining, he says in verse 18, then you shall say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall, you shall eat for tomorrow. Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord saying, who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor 10 days, nor 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. I'm going to stuff you with meat. <laughs> because you have despised the Lord who is among you and have wept before him, saying, why did we ever come out of Egypt? Oh. Wow. You know, there are times when the Lord will answer an unwarranted request. When one of his children or something goes, I just got to have it. I've just got to have it. I need it. I want it. God, give it to me. You know, the Lord just might say, okay. You want it? You're going to get it. And you will learn through the experience of the folly of that request. You know, I think there's sometimes we have to have our noses rubbed in it, you know, to see. And the Lord is not beyond doing something like that or allowing something like that. You want it that badly. Okay, you're going to get it. Listen, listen. It is never a blessing to get what your flesh craves. Never. Psalm 106, 15. Talking about this very event. And he gave them their request, but sent leanness to their soul. That's what it'll do. That's exactly what it'll do. Gratify the flesh the soul grows lean. And, and that's what's happening here. You know, God has given me some pretty profound no's in my life. No. And I want you to know I thank him for those no's. Probably the most profound one was when I was in my first years of college and I was sure I was in love. And I had a girlfriend that I felt was the love of my life. And I just so wanted her to be my wife, my future wife. And it was interesting. I'm not going to go into detail, but every time I prayed about it, the Lord gave me a resounding no. No. But I didn't want to hear that. So... I kept going after what I wanted. And finally, and I thank the Lord for this to this day, he ripped her out of my hands. And just, it hurt. It hurt big time. She was ripped away from me. I cried, you know, hurt, all that. And then the Lord in the fullness of time brought this beautiful young lady named Joyce into my life. And believe me, I can't tell you how many times I've gone, thank you, Lord. The last thing I heard about that other girl, she'd been married and divorced three times. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> and I just, I'm, I'm a blessed man. You know, thank you, thank you, Lord. Letting us have what we're craving, Christian, can be literally the discipline and the chastening of the Lord in your life. Okay, I'm going to teach you a lesson from this. And so, brethren, brethren, you know, 
what to pray for? Pray for the Lord's blessing on your life. Lord, I want your blessing. Not my interpretation of what you blessing me should be like. Meat. Much meat. Your blessing. I want your blessing. I want your good and your perfect will for my life. That's what I want because that's the blessing, you know. And you pray for that. And by all means, by all means, make requests. There's something on your heart. Don't complain. Request. Make request. That's perfectly all right. But, but trust his answer. Trust it. Trust his timing and trust his answer. With a thank you, Lord. He hears all of our prayers. It's not that he doesn't hear your prayers, Christian. You've been redeemed and washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been made righteous before God by the blood of Jesus Christ. He hears your prayers. And so receive his answer. The yes, the no, the timing, whatever, just receive it from him. But say, Lord, you know, when we have a, a board, we have Wednesday mornings, we have our board gets together, we have a prayer meeting. And we, we pray for this body. We pray for you guys. We pray for all kinds of things. We just, you know, we just have a time of prayer together. And I usually wrap it up. And one thing I'm sort of in the habit of saying is, Lord, thank you for being able to just come before your throne, that you invite us to come before your throne and make requests before you. And now, Lord, everything that we've prayed here, we just pray over the top. We pray over all of it. Your will be done. You know? <clears throat> so... So anyway, the Lord is saying, okay, they want meat that bad? They're going to get it. So, verse 21, and Moses said, the people whom I am among are 600,000 men on foot. That means men 20 years old and over that were fighting men. Yet you have said, I'll give them meat that they may eat for a whole month? Shall flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to provide enough for them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to provide enough for them? <laughs> Don't you? God, how in the world are you going to do that? That's impossible. You know? You, 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 I don't know. I mean, Moses is staggered by what God said he's going to do. Kind of reminds me of Abraham when God said Abraham was going to have a son. Scripture says Abraham, not even considering his age or the deadness of, of Sarah's womb, believed God. And, and I, see, I see Moses here going, really, God? <laughs> really? Are, 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 are you actually, actually going to do that? You see, the problem with us is we begin considering, you might say, the the, the physical realities of the situation, quote unquote, the physical realities of the situation. And we decide what can happen and what can't happen, what's possible and what's impossible. You know what we've done? We've left the living God out of the equation. So, verse 23, I love what the Lord says. The Lord said to Moses, has the Lord's arm been shortened? Now you shall see whether what I say will happen to you or not. You just watch, Moses, and see what I do. You know what this tells me right here? God does not always answer our prayers according to our faith. He'll go beyond that. I love what, what Paul says in Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him who is able to do, listen to this. I love to put it this way. Now unto him who is able to do above all that we ask. But that's not what it says. And now unto him who is able to do abundantly above all we ask. Well, that's not what it says. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask. And that's not even what it says. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we ask or think. We can't even imagine. According to the power that works in us, oh, what God can do. 
beyond our imagination. It reminds me of when Peter was in prison in Jerusalem. Remember, and the angel came to release him from prison and his shackles fell off and the, all the, the guards fell asleep, you know, and there was Peter and the angel said, the Bible says the angel had to smite Peter to wake him up. <laughs> wake up, Peter. And then he took him out of the prison, you know, and the prison gate went open, you know, and make a great movie. Isn't it terrible the way you got these great stories in the Bible and Hollywood messes them up every time? <laughs> you just tell the story the way it is. It's exciting. And the Bible says when Peter got out there and the angel left him, he realized he wasn't dreaming. This really happened. He didn't expect it. He wasn't claiming it. It was something God just did. But that's not even the best part. When he goes to the house where he knew the brethren were gathered praying, you know, and they, you know, and they've got the outer gate, you know, and then the inner room, you know, where everybody is. And he's knocking on the gate on the outside. Well, everybody's in there praying. Oh, somebody's knocking at the gate. Rhoda, go answer the gate, you know. I can just see Rhoda, just a young sort of a flighty little girl running out there. Yes, 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 you know, who's there? It's Peter. Peter! She doesn't even open the gate. <laughs> she runs back in. Peter's out there. Oh, these first century believers, such faith. Rhoda, you're stupid. I'm going to add a little bit here. But it's basically what's being said. Rhoda, now I want you to think, Rhoda. Think for a minute. What are we praying about? We're praying because Peter is in prison. He can't be out there because he's in prison. But he is, he is, he is. And so they all go out there, and sure enough, there's Peter. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above. All that you ask or think according to the power that works within us. And God's not above doing that. And so he said, Moses, watch and, and see what I do here. You know, God delights in doing things like this for his servants. Now hear me, hear me, hear me. It's not a miracle of the way keeps the devil away. A miracle a day keeps the devil away. He's doing such mighty things you don't have a clue about. And you won't know till you get to glory. And I think one reason he does that, he doesn't want it to go to your head. Become a spoiled brat Christian. Keep us humble. But once in a while, he'll do something awesome like this in your life, in your ministry. He'll blow you away. And you'll give glory to him. Here and there. He likes to do that. And I guarantee you he will in your life. Here and there. If you're watching and believing and saying, yes, Jesus. That's why I've got this little journal of just, you know, my good news journal, when things have happened in my life where the Lord just something so marvelous, I'll make a little note that I will not forget what the Lord has done. You know? So God says, here's what I'm going to do. So here's what happened, verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Okay, Lord, he went out and just laid it out there. Here's what the Lord has said. You know, and he gathered the 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tabernacle. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. Interesting. The spirit has come upon these guys and it's clear evidence to unbelieving Israel, doubting Israel, that these men have been divinely selected and empowered by the Lord himself. And it was a one-time affirmation to these people. These are ones I have chosen and I am going to use and anoint for my glory. And it's just that, you know, that, that one-time affirmation. It says they prophesied. When you see prophesied in the Bible, don't automatically think they're foretelling future events. 
because prophecy is a much deeper and richer word in that in the Bible than just foretelling future events. It is proclaiming in the power of the Spirit the good things of God. It can be exalting the Lord. It can be magnifying the Lord. It can be, it can be sharing the nature, the heart, the majesty of God himself. What was going on here is these guys were exalting the Lord in such a way that the people were going, that's powerful. That's the Lord. That's mighty. You know, that's what was going on here. And, and once again, you know, it's just saying, God's saying, this is my servant. And what I like about that is God makes clear in his word that when he calls somebody out to be a servant of his in whatever capacity, that God will vindicate that servant, you know? He, he will vindicate that servant. We don't have to defend ourselves. We'll let God vindicate us. I remember a very hard time in my life. Um, Bev Blades came and he said, Brian, this is for you. And it was Isaiah 54, 17. And it says, no weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage, here's the point, of the servants of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, declares the Lord. So you know what? That sets us free. We can let the naysayers go on and do their thing. And we can just carry on and be a servant of the Lord's. And so, and so God's making it clear these are his guys then verse 26, this is interesting. Two men that had remained in the camp, uh, the name of the one was Eldad and the name of the other was Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them. In other words, they didn't come to the tabernacle like Moses asked them to do. They stayed out in the camp. Now, now they were among those listed, but who had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, you know Joshua, one of his choice men answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Don't let them do that. That's not right. You know what God's doing here? He's making it clear that this anointing is not from Moses. It's not about Moses. It has nothing to do with Moses. That this is from God. And God will anoint who God's going to anoint. And I love Moses' response. Verse 29, then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them, i.e. upon them all. Oh, you know, that's the heart of a servant, a true servant of the Lord. Who wants to see God magnified, not about him. It's about seeing God magnified. What are you trying to, you know, to defend me for? It's this empowering is something that's from the Lord. It, and it's for the Lord. There's no, not to be any sense of personal satisfaction or personal glory in, in the anointing of the Lord in the service of the Lord. It's not, gee, I'm special. I know, I know we're all believers and we're all, you know, we're all saved and everything, but you got to admit, I'm special. None of that. None of that. Mm -mm. It's like Paul said in 1 Corinthians to the Corinthians, you're being a bunch of carnal people. As long as you're saying, well, I'm a Paul or I'm of Apollos or I'm of Cephas, you're just being carnal. It's not about Paul. It's not about Apollos. It's not about Cephas. It's the work of God going on in our midst. And we happen to just be instruments in the hands of God for what God is doing for God's glory. It's him, you know. It, it, it's not us. And he, Moses said, I, I just desire that all God's people would experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit and be used mightily by the Lord for his glory. That's my desire. 
You know, Moses never saw that. But listen, listen, guys. This is the glory of the church. This very thing. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Acts 1.8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, all Judea, and to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit coming upon you. Peter gave his first sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. He said in that sermon, referring to when the Holy Spirit came upon those disciples, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see vision, your old men will dream dreams. I haven't dreamed a dream yet, so I don't know if I'm quite an old man yet. I'm still looking, thinking about that one. Joyce has dreams. I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Uh, kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> but, I mean, the Holy Spirit will be active in, in believers, the body of Christ. He says in that chapter, verse 38 and 39, Peter said to them, repent, let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord God will call. Isn't that awesome? The, the, the gifting and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. That that fell on those 70 guys, that spirit that was on Moses is the spirit that's been given to us. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. You are, you, you are indwelt with that spirit, Christian, by believing in Jesus, letting him be the Lord of your life. That's nothing but powerful. No wonder Paul says, and the one commandment in relation to the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18 says, do not be drunk in wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And that's a passive verb. You know, it's not, it, 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 it's let the Holy Spirit fill you. You know. Be in control of your life. So, verse 30. So Moses returned to the camp, he and the elders of Israel. Now, that second issue about the people's complaining. Verse 31. Now a wind went out from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea and left them fluttering near the camp, about a day's journey on the, this side and about a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp and about two cubits above the surface of the ground. Now apparently what is happening here is all these quail have been, in a sense, blown a little off course, and they're coming in, you know, just a day's journey on your side of the camp, on your side of the camp, they, 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 they're coming in masses of them at about two cubits level, about three feet off the ground. You know, they're just, they're just thousands and thousands and thousands of them uh, coming in. Now, there are a, a quail that do, that do migrate from Africa to Europe and then and Europe back to Africa. And I've heard it say that, you know, that coming a long distance, particularly since it came from the sea, you know, they came in over the Mediterranean Sea, they're pretty worn out by that time, and they actually do fly very low to the ground, maybe about three feet off the ground. So you've got, you got, you got all these quail coming, and, um, and, so, and so verse 32, and the people stayed up all that day, all night, and all the next day, and gathered the quail. He who gathered least gathered ten omers, and they spread them out for themselves all around the camp. So they went out there. And, you know, you think about it, three feet off the ground, man, that's just about the batting, batting height, you know. And I can see him out there, you know, with bats, probably baseball bats. And they're out there. And the quail are coming in, and wham, bam, 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 bam. And they're just knocking those quail down and everything. And, and, and they're just... 36 solid hours. They didn't even sleep that night. They're boom, 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 boom. They're getting these quail, man. Get them all. Let's go. We're getting them good. They just keep coming and coming and coming. And they keep batting and hitting and batting and knocking them down. And so the person that gathered the least, 10 omers, is about 60 bushel baskets full. 
So the land had 60 bushel baskets full of quail. And then they went and they spread them all out. You know, the idea there is, is that you can just see them salivating and looking at all those quail. Cookie monster time. Quail. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. We're going to feast now. Boy, are we going to feast, you know. And they're just so, you know, into it. Verse 33, but while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against the people. And the Lord struck the people with a very great plague. So he called the name of that place Kibroth Hata'ava, because there they buried the people who had yielded to craving. You know, make no mistake about it, brethren, their own gluttony led to that plague. It was a plague inspired by gluttony. Their own lust is what killed them. This is interesting because doing everything they could, you know, unbridled, going after the lust of their flesh did not satisfy them. It hurt them. It did not satisfy them. It hurt them. Isn't that the truth? It's clear by the name that Kibroth Hata'ava, or something like that. The name means graves of craving. So it's so clear what happened there. <clears throat> The lesson. This is what happens when a person rejects the Lord and rejects his bountiful supply in favor of an unbridled appetite. It'll kill you. It'll kill you. So, Paul tells us that in Timothy. Six, six to nine. Now, godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world. It is certain that we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Boy, there it is. And then, rather than that, like he says to us in Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, Christian, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. Yeah. Prove out in your life. Amen. So, last verse here. From Kibroth Hata'ava, the people moved to Hazeroth and camped at Hazeroth. God is still faithfully leading these people. And he faithfully guides our walk through the wilderness of our walk, um, brethren, to, uh, to draw us closer to that place where we can just rest in faith in him and, 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 and draw us in a place where our, our walk and, and our fellowship with him can be closer and more intimate, you know? That's the purpose of his leading in our lives. It's to do that in every one of our lives. He's so willing, now listen, he's so willing to take us right where we are right now today and lead us on that path. So thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. It's like the Lord is saying, you want to save yourself a lot of pain? 
Just trust me. I love you. Trust me. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you for the, the lessons in the Old Testament. And Father, we, we see in them that you desire nothing but that which is good for all of us. And trusting you is the way of life. And so, Father, uh, thank you that you've called us into your eternal family. And you have a plan that's good. And you have a goal that is nothing less than beautiful and glorious for every one of us. And, Lord, we want to just thank you for that. And, and Lord, thank you that, Lord, <laughs> by your grace, you're not killing us off. You're teaching us the way of life. Thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.